We are going to talk about an information architecture this morning. How do you build one? Uh, not why you care. I'm assuming that you care. Uh, and so we're just going to talk about how to build one. And then I'm going to talk about some ancillary or adjacent, not necessarily corollaries, but adjacent topics to this topic. So parts of this you'll be going, this is an information architecture. And I'll say, yeah, you're right, but it is, but it isn't. And you'll see what I mean by that in a, minute, in a minute, okay? So we'll talk about these four things. What an information architecture is, it's a thesis and corollaries, how business dysfunction surfaces in a SharePoint deployment, and managing up. So what is an information architecture? The information architecture defines it this way with some fancy words that are three sentences or three lines long. I think the information architecture, as I told those of you who were here yesterday, is just simply the, the delineation of the uh, software programs that we're going to use to manage our hard or our information. Everything else is information design. But that's just me. You can go with this if you want to. Either way, all of the work has got to get done. To me, it's an academic discussion between architecture and design. In the end, it's all got to happen. Okay, so if you want to throw a bunch of this stuff in architecture, you want to shrink down what design is from your perspective, go ahead. I do not have a dog in that race, okay? Now, there are five, according to Forrester anyways, there are five essential artifacts to enable effective information architecture practices. This is Forrester, a business glossary. I do believe in that, and we mentioned that yesterday. If you're going to have meaningful metadata values in your metadata fields, the values have to be defined, and you have to have a shared understanding of what those values are across your organization. Who develops the glossary? In the old days, um, it, it was your taxonomists, your librarians, and not many companies had taxonomists and librarians. Okay? Today, it's your taxonomists and your librarians, and not many companies have taxonomists and librarians. <laughs> So you got to do it collaboratively with your users, which is one of the reasons why I like the Microsoft Managed Metadata Service. It's because you can collaboratively build your taxonomies, and at the same time, you can work with them to build out what these words actually mean within these uh, areas. You need a subject area map, which is a high-level categorization of the types of information available in the enterprise. What did I talk about? For, for me, in the information architecture, it's your big chunks of data. I call it a chunk of data. They're going to call it a subject area map. And then you're going to have entity maps, moderate to low detailed mapping of entities to subject areas, information flow diagrams, and global information model. In my mind, those three things are your design. Okay, so within your chunks, within your big buckets of information, you're going to want to say, okay, what kind of what kind of processing and reporting or analytics do we need on this information as well as what do we get out of it? And um, what kind of IT implementations do we need uh, in order to support this information? Okay. Of course, then your entity maps are up here too. This is just a very different way of saying we've got information, we've got to life cycle it, we've got to process eyes it, and we've got to know what kind of value it brings to our organization, what kind of value do we pull out of it, that kind of thing. Now, most organizations are not going to do a lot of analysis on this kind of stuff because it's, it's, it's at best a savings in opportunity costs. In other words, you're not going to see information management as a line item on the balance sheet for a corporation. And since you're not going to see that, they're not going to invest money in it. The bean counters are going to want to do the things that are necessary to raise equity, shareholder value, that kind of thing. And this, this kind of project is often seen as a money killer, as a profit reducer. Okay? And it's very difficult, really, to come up with ROIs on this. If you do want to get into an information organization project, I would suggest you use the cost of doing business analysis as opposed to return on investment analysis. So a cost of doing business analysis would say it costs us this much money to engage in these activities. If we organize our information, we can reduce the amount of time these activities take by X percent. 
and, and based on the average salaries of those people, we're saving this much money in, uh, in efficiencies. Most counters can handle that, but getting a return on investment, very difficult to do in some of these areas. So I'd like to slide over to the cost of doing business. Um, now this is Forrester, and you can go out and find all kinds of stuff on what makes up an information architecture from a lot of different sources. You're going to hear a lot of different voices out there. You're just going to have to kind of downstep what works in your organization and then stick with it. It's really not so much whether you choose the right thing as much as you choose a thing and then you make it the right thing by sticking with it. Okay? Questions or thoughts at this point? Okay. Are you having more fun than you should be allowed to have? I mean, it's Tuesday morning, you're in London, and you're at a conference. All right. How many actually live here in London? Okay, so if you came to Minneapolis, you'd be going, why am I here at a conference? I should be out seeing Minneapolis. Most of you are going, we don't even know where Minneapolis is. <laughs> it's somewhere in the UK, right. Um, <laughs> all right. Information architecture versus information design. I won't go over any more of that. Core thesis and corollary about SharePoint business and information architecture. Here you go. You ready? A SharePoint deployment will surface dysfunction in your information architecture, your business model, and your business culture. This is a working thesis I've had now for about two to three months, and uh, I'm really starting to like it. Most people think it's a problem with the software. Most people think it's a problem with how the project was run. Most people think it was a problem with the people in the project. Most people think it was a problem with anything other than one of these three things. But if you don't have a good information architecture and a good information design, if you don't have a solid business culture and a solid business model, SharePoint will surface the dysfunction in those areas. Why? Anybody want to take a stab at the why on that? Think this through with me. Why would that be? Because you drag all the skeletons out of the closet when you start using SharePoint to get your processes in. Did you say you drag all the Scotlands? Skeletons. Oh, skeletons. I thought you were making fun of the Scots in here, and I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> because the stuff that doesn't work, mm -hmm. but is hidden because nobody notices, people start noticing when you implement SharePoint because you want to put those processes in your information architecture, you want to get that visual. visual. Yeah. And then you see how wrong it actually is. Yeah. So... Think this through. Is there any other software platform that you will implement that has as wide a touch and feel with as much mission critical information in it other than SharePoint? Any? If it is, tell me. Um, I've seen similar things that are just Domino. Domino? Yeah. Okay. What else? Interwoven. Uh, SAP? Interwoven? CRM? Really? Does CRM have as wide a touch and feel as SharePoint? No. I'll take CRM back off the list. I love you, man. <laughs> right? What does email do? What does Exchange do? Let me put it this way. What does Exchange do? Yeah, email. Thank you very much. It's, this was not a trick question, gang, all right? What does SQL do? Yeah, stores, stores stuff. What does Active Directory do? Arranges. Arranges, it secures stuff, right? What does SharePoint do? It depends. It depends. Oh, you must be a consultant. Um, can anybody tell me what SharePoint really does? Yeah, if, if you could, you, there, there's, your, there's your million quid, right? Imagine the possibilities. What company had that tagline? <laughs> Imagine the possibilities. 
Okay. Software, uh, I'm going to get philosophical here for just a minute. Software represents philosophies and processes. It rep why, do you build, why do you write software to begin with? Because you want to automate a process, more than likely. I'm not, and I'm elevating outside of workflows here. Okay, when you write a Word document, you're still in a process of sorts. Having written 14 books, I can tell you, you're in a process. All right? When you open up Excel, you're doing a process. You're putting formulas to, you're building your own process, but it's still a process of some type. And the software has to be designed with certain business problems or the solving of certain business problems and processes in mind. So the software inherently has its own philosophies about what should and shouldn't happen and in the order that those things should and shouldn't happen. Got it? What if your business model, okay, let me do it this way. What if your business um, cycle doesn't align with the software? And what, um, by the way, I define a business cycle as going from innovation to cash flow. What does it take? from an innovative idea to get that innovative idea into a product, get it built, get it distributed, get it marketed, get it purchased, and then make sure that the costs are controlled so you have a profit. To me, that's the business cycle. Okay? So from innovation to cash flows. If I'm a CIO, I'm, I'm asking too many questions. I'm actually just thinking out loud right now with you. If I'm a CIO, I mean, if I'm a CEO and I've got a five-year business cycle, as a lot of companies do, three years, three and a half years, it's just the way it naturally works out. And now my CIO comes to me and says, we're going to do SharePoint. And I, I don't care about SharePoint. I don't really don't give a rip what software programs my, my company uses because that's not my focus. My focus is just making sure shareholder value, long-term value, governance, risk management, you know, compliance, that kind of, that's, that's on my plate, right? Uh, so I ask a passing question, what does SharePoint do? Provides a platform. It doesn't provide anything. It connects. It doesn't connect people. SharePoint doesn't do that. SharePoint's just a platform, like a the plug and roll for you connect the pieces together. SharePoint's an environment. That's why you don't implement SharePoint. You don't implement SharePoint. You implement business in SharePoint. And that's why SharePoint will surface dysfunction in your business. SharePoint doesn't do a blessed thing for you until you implement it the way that the organization needs it implemented. And if the organization is ill-defined in the area of process, if it's ill-defined in the area of culture, if it's dysfunctional in terms of how it makes decisions, all of those things, SharePoint will surface, not because SharePoint's a bad software package, but because by its very nature, it's not a linear product. It's a hub and spoke. It's a mesh topology pro product that can be used in any number of ways, and the ways it ends up getting used often clashes with the dysfunction in the organization. That's why I keep saying you can learn more about SharePoint by reading the Harvard Business Review than you can by reading a stack of white papers. You consultants in here. It is not about the technology. It is about the business. If you're, if you're a technical consultant and you don't even know how to read a balance sheet, then go get an MBA. You'll be a better SharePoint consultant as a result. Okay, I'm sorry I'm preaching now. <laughs> Questions, thoughts before I move on? Crap, it's already 920. You all okay? I love you. All right. You can't have a good information architecture without a functioning business model and a culture. Why is that? What is a business model? You know what a business cycle is. What's a business model? A business model has several components. Let me just tick them off for you. And by the way, if you're a consultant and you don't know what a business model is, you need to learn. Because if, if you can detect where customers are having problems in their model, then you can help detect what kind of problems they're going to have in SharePoint when they implement this product. Just food for thought. 
You can't have a good information architecture without a good business model. A good business model is going to have core values, clearly articulated and defined, and has behavioral normative statements with it. Okay? A, a good business model is going to have a solid purpose statement, vision statement, and a mission statement. And don't think that those things are unimportant, because they aren't. At MindSharp, our purpose statement is to provide the essential education our customers need to be successful. That's our purpose in life. What's our vision? To be a strategic partner with every customer that we have, helping them realize that they can do more than they ever thought possible with the people in the software that they already have. Okay? That's our vision. Our mission is the first of our 10-year plan, the first year of our 10-year plan. Okay? If, if, if you can't tie SharePoint to clearly articulated mission and vision and value statements and clearly make not just a dotted line but a solid line between SharePoint and where that organization is going, then that SharePoint is probably going to have ill-defined business requirements. And as a result of having ill-defined business requirements, it's going to end up morphing and growing in, a, in ways unknown to man today. Imagine the possibilities, right? <laughs> but if you have to imagine the possibilities with SharePoint, you probably don't have a good information architecture to work with. Because you don't know what your information architecture is or should be until you know what your business model is. Now, most companies, I shouldn't say it that way. Most of your Fortune 500s, the large ones, have good business models. Whether it gets disseminated well through the organization is another ballgame. Most of your mid-range companies, mm, and almost all small business doesn't, they just don't have a, they, you know, it's just didn't part of their, it isn't what they do. Most of them don't have that, okay? But how do you know what information to organize? How do you know what information is essential? How do you know what software platforms are going to manage this information if you can't align that with a, with a clearly articulated business model? See where I'm going with this? You don't have to agree. I just want to know if you, if you understand where I'm going with this. Okay? Questions or thoughts? Now, for many of you, you're sitting here going, yes, great ideas and great theory, Bill, but who cares? Because this isn't where I live in my day-to-day -day world. I'm a project manager. I've got 30 people on my project. You know, I've got 5,000 people in my company. I can't affect change here. So you're really not helping me here other than an academic exercise. Understood. I understand that. What you need to understand is that the more you can understand from a di almost a medical diagnosis viewpoint how the dysfunction over here in the culture and the model exposes or surfaces in your SharePoint deployment, the more you can make those connections, the better off you're going to be in terms of coming up with ways to manage up and to manage around. Okay? That's why I have some managing up slides a little bit later. Questions or thoughts? I'm sorry? Scope of the project. Scope of the project. Um, I work as an architect. You're an architect. You walk in onto the project, usually the business case is already there. Yeah. Right. Uh, you may not be able to actually start considering optimizing the business. Yes. What you, can, what you can do is reflect what is going on in the business. Mm -hmm. Come up here for a minute, would you? <laughs> it's going to slap. No, no. Put, 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 <laughs> put your phone in your pocket. Okay. This is a little fun exercise I do sometimes with people. <laughs> I'm not going to kiss you. All right. <laughs> Let's put our hands up. Okay, now, let's start to push against each other. Okay, push back, come on. Get yeah, a push. push. Yeah, see, you push, no. see what happened? Yeah. What happened? We got out of balance and I had to move. All right? Thanks, I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>
Same, same illustration, or different illustration, same concept. Let's say that you have two people in a boat, a sailboat, and the sailboat's going down the water and the wind's blowing and everything, and one person takes a rope, ties it to the mast, and leans way over the side. What's the other person going to have to do in order for that boat to keep sailing? They're going to have to get on the other side and lean way over the side. They're going to have to balance. This is one of the, this is one of the principles of managing up. You simply make a change that's within your scope, and that change has to have an effect up, down, and sideways. Okay? I was at the state of Illinois yesterday. I talked about the Department of Transportation, the state of Illinois. They were being mandated to implement SharePoint by the Department of Revenue, but they were getting no support from the infrastructure network team that actually owned SharePoint because the infrastructure team didn't want to do it. But since the Department of Revenue was funding it, the SharePoint team had to do it. But the infrastructure team was saying, no, we're not going to let you guys do it. And if you do do it, we're washing our hands of the whole thing. So this team was being asked to implement SharePoint without any authority. You see? What do we do? You push. You push. What do I mean by that? What you do is you say, OK. We're just going to make the rules. And since you have to come through us to use SharePoint, we're just going to make the rules. And we're going to wait for our hand to get slapped. But in the meantime, until it gets slapped, we're making rules. And we are, the rules that we're making are, are having an effect in the culture up, down, and sideways. They were pushing. And as they pushed, other people either had to push back or they had to comply. It's one of the best defensive techniques, quite frankly. If a guy goes to punch you, you can try to stop the punch, or you can grab it and just keep it going. Either way, you don't get punched. One's easier than the other. Do you have an example of the rules that were suggested or they implemented that caused this change? Um, who, who was able to get a site? Right. They said, you know, you got to get, have training before you get a site. Well, we don't have budget for training. Well, then I guess you don't have budget for a site. There's two ways to get a horse in the barn. Most of us will grab the bridle and pull the horse in. A few of us will go around back and pull on the tail, and that'll get the horse in too. <laughs> See what I'm saying? All right. I'm ahead of myself. What did they do to make people? Well, the department of, in this case, the Department of Revenue was already asking for it. Right. So desire was not an issue. Oh, okay. Now, if desire is an issue, we'll talk about that in another session, I think. Yeah, because Steve, Steve and I are going to do something later on, and we're going to talk about user adoption. But um, uh, let me answer, but I don't want to not answer your question. So how many of you have heard of diffusion theory? Diffusion theory. You academics, come on. Don't they teach diffusion theory over here? All right. Go read a book called Diffusion of Innovation. I am not kidding. It'll be the driest book you ever read in your life. But in it, it talks about how you motivate people to adopt a new idea. And it's very effective research, and it's well proven. I'm putting together a white paper on that. It won't be out for several months. Diffusion of Innovations. Make sure you get the third edition. They started out by studying why farmers in Iowa adopt new corn seed. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I can think of more interesting things to look at for my, for my uh, life purpose <laughs> than farmers adopting corn seed. But uh, they have... They have randomized it, probably not randomized isn't the right word, but they have expanded it to talk about um, how users adopt new ideas, period. So for example, what, is that a cell phone, an iPhone, a what phone? What is phone. it? Phone. It's a phone. Great, thanks. <laughs> um, just a lot of help here, buddy. Yeah, Dave, what is that? What is that, Dave? A Windows 7 phone. It's Windows 7 phone. And you have a what? What's this? Oh, it's an iPad. And Linda, you've got the Kindle, right? You've got a Kindle Fire back there. Okay. 
Why is it that you guys in this, how many of you are, you know, you're, you're all UK. You're not Netherlands. You're not Ireland. You're, you're, I mean, you're, you're British, right? No? no? Oh, crap. Am I off the wall? I'm an American, all right? What are you? You're Russian. Okay, crud. All right. Good. All right. We're just going to pretend you all are British for right now, all right? Oh, this doesn't work. Gosh. Why is it that we can get you to adopt a Kindle Fire or an iPad or Windows Phone or whatever in the span of just a few weeks, if not a few months? But it would take a lifetime for you to adopt the imperial system of measurement. Feet, inches, miles, pounds, ounces. You know, you all are UK. You, you guys do kilometers over here. Ah, oh, crud. I thought you did kilometers. I think the word imperial says it. It's our invention. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, what would it take for you to adopt the metric system? A lot. A lot. We have We have Please help me out, Dave. The UK generally has never really adopted uh, kilos or whatever. We, we still deal with the pound. But we sell, they sell stuff in kilos. All right, let me, okay. Okay. Note to self, learn the metric system before you go to the country. All right. What would it take for you guys to adopt driving on the right side of the road? Oh, hush. <laughs> Just hush. Just work with me here. But do you see that some innovations are adopted more easily than others? And the question is, why is that? Diffusion of innovations answers that question. That book will answer that. Something tells me that's a political question, and I ain't getting into it. I'm just a stupid old boy from Minnesota. <laughs> but um, you see where I'm going with this? That diffusion of innovations will answer those kinds it's of questions. Like the tipping points. It's another book called The Tipping Points. Maybe so. Okay. Maybe so. Steve didn't know this, but in his presentation later today when he shows the bell curve with the early adopters and the laggers, and all, that's all diffusion theory, guys. That's where it came from. So uh, read it. Read it and weep. All right. Now, in order to have a mature functioning business, you need a purpose, a vision, a mission, core values, and ethics. You need a good governance plan, risk plan, and compliance. I continue to believe that you cannot talk about governance without talking about risk manglement and compliance. All right? There are three legs of the same stool. Don't draw another stool. All right? <laughs> I love you, Chris. All right. Now, i got to really move along here because I'm just taking up way too much time here. Your information architecture, the design, the putability, and the findability has to align with all of that, has to support it. All right? That's all I'll say about that. How does a dysfunction? These are some ideas that I have, OK? Um, I'm actually thinking about doing the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of SharePoint Disorders. That didn't, that didn't work, did it? See, I was a psychologist for nine years. So I lived in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, right? And I, I specialized in anxiety and mood disorders, right? So, you know, you read that thick book a hundred times or whatever. So I thought it was funny, the SharePoint disorders. 
<laughs> if you, I know, it's a long ways, I'm sorry. If you have a bad business model, you probably are going to have a lack of a cohesive culture. Okay? Uh, or a lack of personal responsibility. So, for example, at MindSharp, one of our core values is lived out in the phrase that we own our words and actions, that we are responsible for our words and actions and their effect on other people. Okay? Well, if you don't have that as a core value in your company, when somebody goes to your SharePoint, then they can say, well, th this is the way that I do it. But if you have that value in your company, you can say, yeah, I understand that's how you do it, but you're still responsible for the effects of your words and actions. So now you have to adjust in order for us to be able to work with what you're doing. You see, it's just a subtle difference. But it's a business model difference. It's an ethics difference. It's a culture difference. Do you see where I'm going with this? Make sense? This is where information kingdoms come up because there's a lack of connection between the grassroots work and the company purpose. If the company doesn't have a long-range purpose, if, 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 the, uh, if the folks within, the, if, if you, in your company, if you can't articulate where the company is going, then you're going to have a tendency, not a tendency, you will substitute your own ideas. It's just, just naturally going to happen. And then you're going to build your information kingdoms around that. And this is where you get your information silos and kingdoms. And SharePoint comes to try to come in and break down those kingdoms. Well, that's fine. But people, you know, people tend to be ferocious about their information management. They, you know, they pee on all four corners of it, right? And they mark it out. This is my stuff because I don't know how my stuff is connected over here, but if I control it, I still get my bonuses at the end of the year. I still get my career advancement. If I understand your question correctly, you're saying you have a lot of people who want SharePoint, but they don't want to break out of their mode. They, want to keep, they have their own little search infrastructure. They want the search to return a specific result with a specific term because that's how it works now. They don't want to see the big picture. How do you, how do you break it they just want it to work for them, and they don't care if how it works for them doesn't work for somebody else. Are they, are, let me ask you, are they connected to a much larger company purpose and committed to it? Okay, so my thing is what you're working with is a symptom of the business problem. Now, you're probably not in a position to resolve that business problem, are you? Okay. So what you do is you slap them a few times. No, just kidding. Um, seriously, what you do is you say, you, you try to appeal, and I realize this won't work for everybody, you try to appeal to their, to their good side and say, look, we'll give you as much as what we can, but some of what we're going to ask you to change is something that we're asking everybody else to change for the common good. See if they'll buy off on that. Look, I'm a big believer. You can only work with people who will work with you. If they won't work with you, chances are you can't work with them, and you're not going to get anywhere anyways. Uh, and we were at a, a $5 billion company that we, that we did some work with. Um, through our company and a sister company that we worked together, we, we delivered services to this company. And this, uh, out of the $5 billion company, about $300 million of profit is generated out of this one division. Okay? Well, that division has a president. Our sister company was able to talk to the people who know the CEO. So they're, one, so they're talking to one step removed from the CEO. And the internal people are trying to get this division to adopt SharePoint and the information architecture that they think this needs. You know what the CEO's response was? Go fly a kite. You know why? Because that guy's making me $300 million a year, and until he starts to screw up, I'm not going to fix something that isn't broken. You can only work with who you can work with. Well, but... But if you do this, you might, you might, I know what I'm already getting. I'm not going to gamble losing. You think my shareholders are going to be happy that I lost money on this for one year because I implemented an information architecture in SharePoint that didn't work? You think a CEO is going to take that gamble? No, not in a million years. 
Not going to happen. Not in a public company. You can only work with who you can work with. What about compliance? Information architecture symptoms when it comes to compliance. Um, you may not know what information to retain for audits. That's a bad thing. It's one thing to know what you don't know. It's another thing to not know what you don't know. And you do not want to be in that latter camp. Unethical use of information to further narrow ends. Anybody seen that recently? E-discovery processes are overly costly and burdensome. In the United States, they estimate the average e-discovery process is now in excess of $3 million. Why? Because most companies haven't organized their information from an e-discovery standpoint so that when the lawsuit comes, they spend an inordinate amount of time either recreating information or going through old backup tapes or whatever to try to find the information. Sometimes it's redundant, sometimes it's missing, sometimes it's in paper, sometimes it's in microfish, sometimes it's on somebody's laptop at home. Okay? It can be incredibly costly. Out of compliance, behavior is tolerated. Okay? A lot of you aren't in a position to do much about this, but if, out of, but if you're a consultant or if you're in a company where out of compliance behavior is tolerated, just know that you are in a place where there's dysfunction and your information architecture is only going to go so far. Okay? Unethical behavior is tolerated. We don't want that. What about governance? Governance takes a shotgun approach and feels randomized due to a lack of clear standards against which to govern. You govern against compliance standards mainly, which is why the governance is there to try to lower risk. And compliance is a huge risk for companies today. IA becomes the responsibility of IT. If IA is the responsibility of IT in your company, that's a huge sign that there's a huge dysfunction in the business model. Why? Because it's the content owners who should manage that content and be responsible for it, not IT. IT just provides the platforms and the services, which is why there's, there really is a misnomer here. Um, Anymore, you know, we started out calling IT information technology as if they were managing information when really they were just managing hardware and software. And we need another name for them. An HIA kingdom takes on a set of unique, sometimes conflicting rules of engagement. How many of you have this? That's part of that information kingdom thing, right? Okay. Now, some, in, some of those symptoms from risk manglement here. Easily obtained information about risk is ignored. I know of one company where easily obtained compliance information about payroll was said to have been uh, procured, and it was not. And as a result, when the state came to uh, talk to this company about uh, their lack of compliance in certain payroll areas, it resulted in significant fines for this company. Needless to say, that controller was fired. Okay. Lack of findability exposes organization to e-discovery risk. Lack of compliance creates significant exposure to risk. I'm starting to repeat myself, aren't I? Okay. So what do you do here? How do you build this out? Um, I'm just going to go through this because I, I got some other stuff I got to do. Quarter till. I end at 10 or 10:15. 10, do I end at 10:30? 11? <laughs> Ten? Thanks. So, look, gang, however you want to define your architecture, the point is, is that within each of your chunks, you're going to have to taxonomize it in some way. Now, this does not include the whole mobile thing that I talked about yesterday, where I think, I think we're going to find that mobility becomes a method of organizing. And I don't even know how to think about that hardly, but all of us need to be thinking about that in some way. Um, but you're going to have to have your information designed per group, which includes your tagging. It includes your, uh, your putability and findability tools. It's the tools of how it goes in and how it comes out. That's all part of the design. It's the interfaces. It's the security around it, all that. You might have to have a, an MMS hub there. Certainly content type development in SharePoint will be a part of this bad boy. And then you're going to have to have what I, I overuse of the word governance here, but management and maintenance, really. And you're going to have to make sure that people use the tools, that, that that's what they want to do. All of this has to happen in order for you to have good ROI on your information. Okay? Excuse me, Bill. Uh, sorry, just a question. Is there, is there something missing on there? It's, it's, it's unfortunate on there. 
Yeah, it is. And in the three years I've presented this, you're the first person who's noticed that, because I didn't even notice that. So I've got to get support on there. By the way, why did I put money in red? Because that's already regulated through your SEC and your government agencies and your GATT principles and that kind of thing. You don't need to worry about taxonomizing money. You just don't have to worry about that. From September 2011 on the state of workforce technology adoption from Forrester, what devices do you use for work? Desktop, laptop, smartphone, and tablet. This tablet number is going to grow substantially. Okay? How often do you work from the following locations? From the office, home, client site while traveling. Now put that matrix together and then begin to think about how you're going to organize your information in such a way so that all four of those devices can get at all the information that people need to get at from all four of those locations securely, on demand. Because that's the nature of business today. All right? How many tablets were sold in the United States in the fourth quarter of last year? Does anybody know? Just iPads. Just iPads. The estimates are in the six million range and rising. That was just in the fourth quarter. Okay? Amazon's Kindle came out at $200, and the Kindle sold like hotcakes. They couldn't, they couldn't keep the stores. In all honesty, those of you who have laptops still, me, I think three years all of us will just be walking around with tablets. I think laptops will be a thing of the past. BlackBerry leads smartphone use, but not for long. They're, they're in the NFL, not for long. Um, for those of you who are Americans, that's a, that's a good one, right? You know? yeah. Employees pick the phone they want. That's a big deal because employees are going to end up picking the phone they want, and then IT has to support it. In some companies, that's not the case. IT says we'll only support these phones and these models. Users still go out and pick up their stuff, and if it doesn't work, they're screwed, yeah, but so is the business. Still hurts the business. So how did you choose the primary smartphone you use for work? 48% without considering what their company supports. They just don't care. It's about me. It's not about you. It's about me. More senior staff use mobile devices. We would think it would be the opposite, but look at this. Use of smartphones and tablets for work, direct or above, 76%. Individual workers, 25%. Who are the people that are driving this thing? It's your upper level management. Why do they do it? Because they travel so much, they're tired of logging around all this stuff. I'm a member, I'm a member of a Vistage group. I'm a CEO in my own company, and I'm a member of a Vistage group. And if you know anything about Vistage, there's 15,000 CEOs a part of this thing worldwide. In my group in Minneapolis, of 15 CEOs, half of them have tablets, I, iPads. I, I'm not one of them. I still got the, the Toshiba clunker. Right. What applications do you use on the primary smartphone you use for work? Email, work calendar, uh, and calendaring. How does this impact information architecture, information design, how you organize information? I don't have a good answer for that. You're probably saying, well, then why am I here? Well, because at least I'm getting you to think about the question. Sometimes, in all honesty, the best education is just getting people to think about the right questions. Here are some problems Fizz Oil will face. Remember, we have a company that is really made up of three companies that have come together. Okay? Here's some of the problems Fizz will face. Combining dissimilar IAs from acquisition. How many of you are involved in acquisitions in your, in your environment? How many of you just love the fact that you can grab another company, they become acquired, and pretty soon you'd have no idea what information they have or where it is? Yeah, getting that culture to change their information architecture to match yours is a multi-year process and probably means the transition of some of their key people 
in order for it to happen. No? Um, my experience, basically, I work with a pharmaceutical company that is managing regional global IT services. And on a monthly basis, two companies would be bought, two companies would be sold. My team had to make the new company compliant with the existing. Obviously, there were other teams, business teams, that were reorganizing from business side of the stuff. And you were able to do that on a monthly basis? Oh, yeah. Wow. No, no. We kick off the project. It takes you three to six months to okay. the size, but you can do it and it can change. Wow. Wow. This is a process. This is day to day business. Dude, man, if you got that, pro see him. What's your name? Boris. Art? Pardon? Boris. Boris. You guys see Boris if you want a six month process on how to get an information architecture changed in an acquisition. I've never heard of a six month before. So cool, that's cool. Have, when you have the correct, well, it's either, this is pharmacy, if those guys are not compliant, the whole market, U.S. market for specific drug will go down. That's billions. Yeah? Well, yeah, okay, so you are in a more regulated industry to begin with. Yeah. Okay, that probably helps. Yeah. You can't afford this kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Managing disgruntled employees who will passively resist compliance with IA. Anybody ever worked with people who resist through passivity? <laughs> okay, how many of you are managers in here? How many of you manage at least one person? Okay, how many of you manage passivity? Every hand should stay up. All right, it's just the way it is. And there was a hostile takeover. Now, to me, a hostile takeover means it was hostile. It wasn't friendly. So you might have some employees who will passively resist. And the merger of Fizz and Zebra, Zebra, how do you guys say it over here? Zebra, Zed, Zebra, got it. No, I'll say Zebra, don't worry. <laughs> then I'll really sound out of place, right? A Minnesotan saying Zebra. We'll raise questions about Zebra's independence, okay? Worldwide presence sig represents significant issues here. Okay, asynchronous collaboration. You ever, I've done this, but it's not easy sometimes to collaborate asynchronously with somebody in significantly different time zones. The last, uh, one of my SharePoint admin companion books that I wrote, uh, Kathy Hughes in Sydney wrote, I don't know, five, six chapters of it out of the 20 some chapters. Uh, you'd send off an email and you'd get an answer back two days later, and for her that was only 12 hour difference or eight hour difference or what? I mean, it's just stupid. She wrote great stuff, but sometimes the collaboration didn't work very well. Difference in meaning for identical words leads to difficulty in global metadata development. Hello? What's a bonnet in the UK and a bonnet in America? Two different things, entirely. You know, you guys have a boot, we have a boot, but you don't, we don't put your boot on our feet. Right? So, very, very different. Collaborating across cultures, time zones, and dissimilar past corporate experiences will be difficult. They have got, I think, Fizz Oil has significant cultural and IA integration issues. And I don't know that a six month process might work for part of it, but I think some of this is a multi year process. And it probably involves the transition of key people out of parts of the organization and hiring other people and coming in and just starting over. Okay? Now, other problems, people will not want to connect if the merger threatens their job security, level of responsibility, or perceived clout. You've probably seen that once or twice, right? Innovation can't occur until there's standardization. That's, I'm surprised at how many people argue that point with me. I don't think you can innovate until you standardize. It's because standardize sounds scary and controlling. But how do you know what to change, or how do you get a good idea if you don't have a standard from which you're working? So it's just between standardization and standards, though. Because a standard is something you aspire to as opposed to standardization where you reject right. that. So I think, I think you can have innovation where you've got standards, but then you give the benchmark against which you're innovating. But you can't innovate a process. Without, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Anyways, very difficult to exploit data globally if the different IAs are not merged and scrubbed. 
More to the point, you're going to have some of this uh, IA that's going to have to take into consideration not just WANs, but low bandwidth, and sometimes non-existent bandwidth, and sometimes lack of synchronization for days or weeks on end. I'm sure both of our militaries face this. You know, the British military goes out, the American military goes out, sometimes they go out on these deployments for weeks at a time, and the only way they can connect is through satellite. And so they hook up every so often, and they synchronize, but then they got the SharePoint farm and it's offline again. Five minutes? Thanks. So how do we manage up in some, okay, so let's, I talked about managing up earlier, so I'll, I'll just blow through some of this stuff. But I do think that you have to understand who you can work with and who you can't and that your information architecture is only going to get built as, as good as the culture will allow it to be built. Some of you might be really disappointed with this session. You might have come to this session hoping that I was going to show you step-by-step -step process on how to build an information architecture. You guys, there's a thousand and one books out there that will show you how to do that and a thousand and one other presenters who will show you how to do that. Not a lot of them will talk about the adjacent issues surrounding this that are going to stop you. They're going to hinder you. What I'm trying to do is to help you be successful back at the office. If you're a middle manager, you might be wondering how to implement what you've heard. Let me give you some ideas on this. First of all, managers, this is from Harvard Business Review. Just understand that managers, especially upper level managers and C-suite people, they work at an incredible pace. Okay? Uh, most CEOs, their 50% of their activities last less than nine minutes a study revealed. So they go from this to this to this to this to this. I don't know if you've ever talked to upper level managers in these companies, but they are to the point people. They really are. You sit down and, and you, small, you might get a, hey, how are you? I'm fine. You might get a, how are you back? And then it's on, and then, then we, we are on to it, right? Coffee breaks and lunches usually work oriented, and 93% of the CEO verbal contacts are ad hoc, which means they're either emailing or they're picking up the phone and calling somebody on the fly. I'm not saying this is good. I'm saying it's what it is. Now, managers strongly favor verbal media, telephone calls, and meetings over documents or aggregated data. Most of us believe the opposite. Most of us believe that what they want is hard data so they can make data-driven decisions. And they do. But most of these folks are rather attuned and intuitively know that the soft information they hear is really more important sometimes than the hard data that they get. And they'll take disparate conversations from disparate people and they'll tie a thread between those conversations and make a decision on that thread because their intuition tells them that's what they should do. I know that I've done that. Somebody will say something to me, and two months later, somebody will say something else, and I connect those two dots. No one else in the organization connected them. I'll make a decision on that. One of the things I learned as a psychologist is that you get the truth in passing comments. There would be times when people would spend an entire hour with me in therapy, and I never really felt like we were getting anywhere until they were walking out the door and they'd make a passing comment, finally got the truth. Listen to how people talk. Listen to how people say things, especially with passing comments, because that's where you get the truth. Okay? Projects emerge as a series of small decisions and actions sequenced over time. A lot of you are going to be looking for major decisions out of your managers. A lot of times they don't make major decisions. They make incremental, iterative decisions that lead them eventually, in the aggregate, to a big decision. And they tend to comprehend complex issues gradually, and all of us do this, really, rather than through concentrated learning, where now I get this, okay? Most of us will do it that way. Most authoriza authorization decisions are based on ad hoc information, <coughs> and they have to balance choices between competing interests and competing influencers. And sometimes, their decisions will not make sense to you because you don't understand. It's not that you're stupid, and it's not, it's not that they haven't communicated well. They simply cannot communicate all of the various trade-offs that they have to take into consideration on certain decisions. And by the time that decision gets disseminated throughout the organization, there's a fair amount of misunderstanding about it. 
I've had that happen to me a couple of times where I've had to make a decision and my staff didn't get it. And I couldn't tell them why. I, one of the things about leadership, if you're in leadership, you have to be willing to be misunderstood at certain points and just live with it because that's just part of being a leader. That's part of managing and, and, and going after some things. So make sure your dashboards, i will talk about managing up in a minute. Make sure your dashboards, give them the hard information that they need, but then link the information to the people who created it. Because chances are your C-level, your C-suite people and your upper managers are going to want to talk to those people. Because they're going to have a question about that information that isn't answered in the dashboard. And they're going to want to ask questions because they favor verbal media over aggregated data. Okay? Here's your seven rules for managing up. It is about your boss. It is not about you. I know I'm over time. I love you all. I'm over time. I'm arrogant enough to think that this is still important. All right? Know what matters to your boss. If you don't know what matters to your boss, then get in there and find out. All right? If you can help your boss succeed, you will succeed. That's one of the big things about managing up. Figure it out. All right? Say yes to things that matter to your boss. <laughs> no to everything else. That's a little bit of an overstatement, but it's not far off the mark. All right? Oh, sorry. Talk like your boss. So if you're from Indiana, you talk. You walk. <laughs> you take chalk on the board. All right? Um, with, a, with a grain of salt, toot your own horn to your boss. A lot of times, your boss isn't going to know what your accomplishments are. And in the absence of not knowing what your accomplishments are, your boss is going to think you're not doing anything. It's okay to go into your manager and say, I just want you to know what I've accomplished. Here's what I've done. And in a, in a nice way, the, and here's how this is furthering your goals. It's not kissing up. It's managing it. There's a difference. All right? Have, grab, initiate lunch with your boss on occasion, all right? And seek new respect. Is there something else I can take on, oh boss? You know, I, I, and this, by the way, especially if it aligns with your personal professional growth, is a great way to manage up. Because you can say, um, I really want to kind of try to grow in this area. Is there a responsibility that you can give me that would help me grow in this, that would also help further our department goals or divisional goals or whatever? It's a great question to ask. Not many people ask that question. All right. Don't lie. Balance your boss's needs with your own needs. But my boss is a jerk. My boss is patronizing and arrogant. He uses intimidation, sarcasm, fear to motivate. He's an idiot. Yes, he really is that stupid. Some of you might think your boss really is dumb. Maybe your boss is a politician, will say whatever is needed at the time to get through things, right? He's a serpent, blatantly untrustworthy, a snake in the grass kind of person, you know, ready to bite you at any given time. And a workaholic. I had one friend, I'm not kidding, his manager had meetings, started meetings for her team at 4 a.m. in the morning <laughs> and expected people to be on conference calls at 4 a.m. It wasn't a global company. Uh, it, was all in, it was all in the zero, negative, six GMT. So <laughs> some bosses are apathetic. They don't make decisions, that kind of thing, right? Just shoot straight. Never lie. Never exaggerate. And never minimize. Your word is one of the greatest things you have at managing up and managing out. If people know that your words mean exactly what you say, nothing more, nothing less, that is one of the best ways for you to manage up. Okay? Make decisions only when necessary, but when you make them, inform and document. Okay? Inform and document. Stay out of the politics, which is tough to do. And finally, stay out of the emotions, which is even more tough to do. I could talk to... Okay. I took way too much time. I love you guys. Come back.